Thanks for joining us for this teach-in on uh, U.S. military activities on the African continent and the um, development of U.S. AFRICOM as uh, the institutional vehicle for U.S. military power uh, in Africa today. Um, my name is Matthew Almonte. I am a member of DSA's International Committee. Uh, I'm also a co-coordinator of the Black Alliance for Peace Solidarity Network, uh, whose purpose is to organize support for the organization among non-African individuals and organizations. Um, so <clears throat> tonight's event has been organized and is being hosted by our Middle East and Africa subcommittee. It, uh, it will be recorded and shared uh, online. Uh, if you have any thoughts or questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Uh, you can follow up with us by emailing the address uh, provided. And we would like to uh, thank our co-sponsor, DSA's Afro-Socialists and Socialists of Color Caucus for endorsing this event. So <clears throat> we would like for this uh, teaching to function as a group discussion with, with room for participation. Um, so please feel free to provide remarks or reflections in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, we're gonna be reading from some texts. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer to read a bit here and there, that would be great. Uh, we'll be watching a few short videos and discussing the material together. So uh, this um, teaching is being done in conjunction with the Black Alliance for Peace's uh, International Month of Action Against AFRICOM. And uh, the goal of tonight's teaching is to impart a basic understanding of um, the purpose, history, and impact of AFRICOM on the African continent and to develop among participants a uh, commitment to anti-militarism and the total liberation of Africa. Now, uh, raising awareness is not an end in itself, but a means toward organizing and encouraging action. So we hope that you'll leave this space tonight uh, committed to the task of decisively challenging and defeating US imperialism, which remains the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. The United States poses the greatest threat to the future of humanity and the preservation of all life on this planet, human and non-human. And so if we're committed to acting in solidarity with people's organizations and movements all over the world, all over the African continent, uh, struggling for their lives, their sovereignty, their national liberation, our duty is to act, uh, to organize, to build, to mount a decisive effort in order to weaken the West um, and its colonial capitalist patriarchal system, which has enveloped the world uh, in order to build socialism across the world and to move humanity forward. So uh, we can start with uh, what is the Black Alliance for Peace? And uh, before we get into a short video uh, uh, produced by the organization to provide background and context for its purpose uh, and its objectives, we can begin with this short description. Uh, the Black Alliance for Peace seeks to recapture and redevelop the historic anti-war, anti-capitalist, and pro-peace positions of the radical Black movement. Through educational activities, organizing, and movement support, organizations and individuals in the Alliance work to oppose both uh, militarized domestic state repression and the policies of destabilization, subversion, and the permanent war agenda of the United States globally. So now we can go ahead and watch a short video uh, to provide a little bit further context here. The U.S. is birthed from savagery. Europeans committed genocide against native peoples and stole their land, all while kidnapping and enslaving native 
and African people to turn a profit. Now, over 400 years later, the United States is a massive empire. It has 800 military bases and at least a dozen colonies scattered across the globe. Ever since its founding, the U.S. has always been at war, and it's the only country in history to use nuclear weapons against people. At this very moment, the U.S. is engaged in at least seven wars of occupation and regime change. The mission? To ensure U.S. businesses have access to land, resources, and cheap or slave labor. But the 1% also wages war against Black and colonized people in the U.S., just as they've done from the start. Police continue to murder, brutalize, and surveil Black people. Our communities are impoverished, starved of resources, and thrown in jail. All the while, police departments become more and more like occupying armies. And the military budget, well, it just keeps getting bigger. The Black Alliance for Peace was launched in 2017. The Black Alliance for Peace, uh, as an organization, are committed to revitalizing the traditional anti-war positions of the Black community. The United States is the worst abuser of human rights in the world. If you look at these invasions, the proxy wars, the sanctions, the powers that be are seeing a threat to the status quo. It does not matter whether the United States government agrees with Maduro and his policies because six million Venezuelans wanted him. Our campaign is no compromise, no retreat. Defeat the war on African Black people in the U.S. and abroad. The campaign includes the demands to end police militarization stop their training by the Israeli Defense Force, shut down Africa, remove all U.S. military presence from Africa, defund the military, and close the 800 military bases around the world. Black people have always been the consciousness and change agents within this brutal regime now can be no different. We are in the heart of the empire and we must remember our fight for liberation is connected to the liberation of black, brown, and working class people everywhere. It is time for us to stand up to oppose U.S. war and murder and defeat the U.S. EU, NATO axis of domination. That is why the Black Alliance for Peace was founded. And that is why we need you. All right. So um, that was a brief description of the Black Alliance for Peace. Um, Let's uh, now we can move into uh, a short uh, open discussion about the history between Africa and the United States um, and, and what we know about the history between Africa and the United States. Um, one second here. Trying to see if our, our chat function works here. Um, okay, well, why don't I go ahead and start us off here um, about the history between Africa and the United States. Okay, so I know, for example, 
that um, in the same vein as it does today uh, with regard to supporting <clears throat> the uh, apartheid Zionist state, uh, which terrorizes the people of Palestine uh, every day since the establishment of that settler colony so many years ago, uh, the United States also spent decades uh, providing political, military, and economic support and giving a resounding middle finger to the international community, which opposed such actions, uh, to the government of South Africa, which we know was ruled by a ruthless white minority uh, for many years. In fact, it was the United States uh, which assisted South African intelligence services um, in their effort to locate and incarcerate Nelson Mandela in 1962. Uh, and he would remain incarcerated for nearly 30 years for his contributions to the South African freedom struggle uh, in the 20th century. Uh, I believe this is emblematic of the relationship between the United States and Africa. And so um, another, I believe, important piece of history between Africa and the United States um, is, uh, for example, that following the African-Asian People's Solidarity Conference hosted by Gamal Abdel Nasser in Cairo, Egypt in 1957, uh, NATO's Committee on Political Advisors uh, met to strategize on how best to counter, undermine, and ultimately destroy what they described as the threat of a communist nationalist alliance against the West. And this committee understood clearly the threat posed not only by a communist nationalist alliance among decolonized Asian and African states, uh, but also Nasser's overtures toward Afro-Arab solidarity and pan-Arab unity. These are threats to the West. And so these countermeasures adopted by NATO, uh, by this committee, uh, were unfortunately successful as evidenced by the curtailment of African, Asian political and economic unity in the following years. Again, this is emblematic of the relationship between the United States and Africa. Uh, and, um, you know, if we step back just a little bit further, we know that uh, by 1860, the economic value of enslaved Africans in the United States was more than $4 billion. Uh, you know, this single financial asset, enslaved Africans, held more value than all of the banks, railroads, and factories in the United States at that time. This wealth built the United States into what it is today. This wealth produced more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi River Valley than any other part of the country. This wealth was stolen and accumulated from Africa by the United States. And this is not irrelevant, okay, as we continue to observe the legacies of the early history of the United States, which are still with us today. Okay, one second. Um... We might have a tiny bit of technical difficulties here. Um, excuse me. Okay. So, um, now we can move into, um, a short reading, um, a short reading published by uh, the Black Alliance for Peace in the Black Agenda Report um, in 2021. And uh, it, we can begin here um, with reports each week of yet another Black victim of police violence. Uh, there is for many, an ever-growing desperation. 
uh, as activists search for a way forward, Africa's plight does not find its way onto the movement agenda. But there is good reason to be concerned about what goes on in Africa. The problems there and the problems here are related. I'm sorry, give me one second. Might be having some. Okay, here we go. I think we just resolved that and get back here. Okay. So let's see here. So um, we'll pick back up. Africa has long been the focus of foreign exploitation of the continent's land, resources, and people. As everybody knows, Africans find themselves in the Western Hemisphere because of slavery and its exploitation of the labor of those who are enslaved. But the interest in Africa of those foreign to that continent was not limited to human trafficking. There's an even greater interest in Africa's gold, diamonds, cobalt, oil, and other natural resources, too numerous to list. And um, because Africa was colonized by Western capitalist interests and robbed of its wealth, Africans resisted and drove the colonizers from the continent, or so they thought. In the years since independence came to Africa, it has become painfully clear that European colonizers have managed to retain their grip on the continent by various means, including the manipulation of corrupt African uh, public officials. The United States has always had its hand in the exploitation of Africa, but it has never been widely regarded as a colonizer. And the United States likes it this way because it's helpful to its global image as a benevolent, justice-loving, democratic nation. But under cover of darkness, the United States has played a leading role in maintaining an iron Western grip on Africa. Sorry about that. Um, observers note that in 2019, US Special Operations Forces were deployed in 22 African countries. And in recent years, these troops have engaged in active combat in at least 13. In addition to direct combat, US military forces conduct joint training operations with the military forces of most of the countries on the African continent. These operations are carefully designed to serve US interests. And if the interests of host African countries are also served, it is coincidental. All of this military activity is sponsored and coordinated by US Africa Command or AFRICOM. Now, the public statements made by AFRICOM about its work are crafted to portray the command as an armed Peace Corps that digs wells, delivers medicine, and builds hospitals while simultaneously protecting African villages from international terrorists. But the reality is that the mission is to advance and protect the operations of Western corporations. And when it comes to that job, the United States is eclipsed only by the French. France has maintained an active uh, and uh, aggressive military presence in Africa for years. And the United States has been an enthusiastic supporter. AFRICOM makes no secret of this fact. Uh, U.S. Army General and former AFRICOM Commander Stephen J. Townsend stated that France is the United States' oldest ally and a leader in the counterterrorism fight in Africa. We share common threats, mutual concerns, and a commitment to fighting violent extremist organizations. Now that comment translated means that the United States teams with France to protect Western corporate interests and brands anyone who gets in their way a terrorist. And this can sometimes have fatal consequences. In 2017, four US soldiers were killed in Niger. Now the reason for their presence in that country was not clearly explained 
by the Pentagon, but it's likely that their mission was related to the fact that for decades, the French company Arriva has mined uranium in Niger for French consumption and established extensive operations in the Nigerian town of Arlit. In 2013, France began to fear attacks on these facilities and deployed troops to protect them. The United States also deployed troops in the region and four soldiers paid the price with their lives. And we know that Libya too was the site of French and US military meddling that ultimately plunged that country into total violent chaos. The objective was to frustrate the late Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's efforts to establish a Pan-African currency, which would devalue the French franc and to gain control of Libya's oil fields, among other reasons. Western domination of Africa's wealth by military force hurts Africa, but it also hurts African people in the United States. And although many harbor stale beliefs that the people of Africa care nothing about their stolen African family members in the United States, the contrary was proven dramatically by Africa's outpouring of support and solidarity in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder. Imagine the changes that would have occurred if those demonstrations of support had been accompanied by financial support to the movement, diplomatic arm twisting, and economic pressure. But Africa cannot demonstrate that type of independence and power because the entire continent has a giant US military boot on its neck. And it falls on those of us who are up close and personal to AFRICOM to untie the laces of that boot and cause the US military operations in Africa to trip and crash. So now we can get into the meat and potatoes of AFRICOM and what US AFRICOM is. And we can start with a short video again produced by the Black Alliance for Peace uh, to describe AFRICOM and the need to shut down US Africa Command. So why don't we take a look at that? Militarized police violence carried out against Black and other non-European colonized peoples domestically and the brutal violence of the US military and intelligence agencies abroad have two sides of the same white supremacist colonial capitalist coin. That is why for the Black Alliance for Peace, it is vital that the public understand this connection. The U.S. made bombs bursting in air remind us that U.S. imperialism is still alive and well. The U.S. commitment to the concept of full spectrum global dominance is carried out in many forms, including 11 command centers that are headquartered across the world. The U.S. Africa Command or AFRICOM puts most African states under the effective of military control of the United States. The Indo-Pacific Command is the counterpart to AFRICOM in the Asia Pacific and is being used to direct military aggression towards China. Two years after the end of the Second Imperialist War in 1945, the U.S. established the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command Center in 1947, formerly known as the U.S. Pacific Command Center. Its area of responsibility encompasses about half the Earth's surface. The 36 nations that comprise the Asia Pacific region are home to more than 50% of the world's population. The U.S. has 375,000 enlisted members of its Indo Pacific Command, including 60% of its Navy ships, 55% of its armies, and two thirds of its Marine Corps. In addition, with 85,000 foreign deployed soldiers and a large amount of high tech and new weaponry, the U.S. military has maintained its absolute supremacy in the Asia Pacific over the years, while also continuing to seek new deployments, budgets, and resources using the threat of China's and Russia's strategic rivalry as a justification. South Korea, Guam, Australia, Malaysia, and a host of other countries have strengthened military arrangements with the United States over the last decade. In 2007, the Bush administration announced the establishment of the U.S. African Command Group. We're going to Benin, Tanzania, Rwanda, Ghana, and Liberia. Each of these countries is blessed with natural beauty, vibrant culture, and an unmistakable spirit of energy and optimism. Africa in the 21st century is a continent of potential. Africa, that was then fully launched on October 1st, 2008. The U.S., which currently has the largest military budget in its history, spends nearly $1 billion per year 
carry out imperialism in Africa. A study by the commission that in the majority of cases, state action appears to be the primary factor violently pushing individuals into violent extremism in Africa. Of more than 500 former members of militant organizations interviewed for the report, 71 percent pointed to government action, including killing of a family member or friend or arrest of a family member or friend as an incident that prompted them to run into it. And the cycle continues. Drone attacks breed recruitment, which produces further terror attacks, which leave the states involved more dependent on U.S. military support. This is how the West creates the demand for Africa. We must demand that the U.S. shut down Africa and the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. No compromise, no retreat. No compromise, no retreat. The independence of Ghana is not for anything. No, yeah. yeah. I can tell them that the good people of this country, overwhelming majority of people of this country, flatly and totally rejects this attempt to send us back into colonialism. We will never be colonized again. All right. So that gave a brief um, a brief look at uh, AFRICOM and the need to shut down AFRICOM. Why don't we go ahead and review some of these facts um, that U.S. Africa Command is one of uh, 11 of the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense or War Department, as it's more aptly described, um, 11 of these combatant commands with a geographic function and mission that uh, provides command and control of military forces, particularly on the African continent. It's responsible for all uh, U.S. DOD exercises and security operations on the continent, on its island nations, and in its surrounding waters. It initially was developed in 2007 and began uh, became fully operational in 2008. And by 2019, 44 African countries had partnered with AFRICOM. Uh, and this all uh, was uh, developed due to the increasing strategic importance of Africa uh, as instructed by then President George Walker Bush. So what is the purpose the real purpose of AFRICOM. Now, the real purpose of AFRICOM is to enable terrorism, while at the same time prosecuting the war on terror in Africa. Now, this is contradictory, but this is the operating logic as we've seen it in West Asia as well, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, to enable terrorism, while at the same time claiming to be fighting a war against terror. And, uh, AFRICOM is able to nurture and justify its own reason for being by operating this way. And so um, research data shows a marked increase in terrorist groups operating in Africa since AFRICOM's founding. Okay. So why is the Black Alliance for Peace opposed to Africa? And it's because in, in our principles of unity, BAP takes a resolute anti-colonial anti-imperialist position that links the international role of the US empire to the domestic war against black, I'm sorry, against poor and working class black people in the United States. And here we can see from above some of these other command centers. We see that the United States has expanded all over the world and views the entire planet as its zone of control. There's a European command, a Southern command, Indo-Pacific command. This is the jurisdiction of the United States as it sees it, and it's operating everywhere. Now I'd like to move into a short um, clip from a webinar, uh, a Black Alliance for Peace webinar that uh, occurred in October. And, and I find this to be very instructive. It's um, a very instructive case study of U.S. military activities in Somalia provided, provided by Jamila Osman of Resist U.S.-Led War. Um, so why don't we go ahead and take a look at that and hear about U.S. military activities in Somalia in this context. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And Comrade Ezra, thank you so much for your words. So I'm gonna start by talking about the US shadow war in Somalia and the effects of US militarism and violence on the Somali nation and people. 
It's important to note that the current pretext for AFRICOM's involvement in Somalia is counterterrorism. So the war on terror gave imperialists the necessary cover for their excursion and lasting presence in the country. A closer examination of history illustrates that not only did U.S. involvement actually predate the existence of al-Shabaab, but their presence has only strengthened the group's ideological and political will and power. We're currently witnessing an escalation of drone strikes and aerial bombings in the fight against terrorism in the country in a coordinated effort by the United States and the Somali federal government. And it's again, it's important to note that these offensives are occurring during an incredibly precarious time in the country. Climate change has had a devastating impact on the Horn of Africa. We're seeing a deadly drought and impending famine, which is reminiscent of the 2011 drought that killed over 200,000 people in the area. Famine and drought are political crises as much as they are environmental ones. Aid groups can't provide resources to al-Shabaab controlled areas of the country because of sanctions, yet al-Shabaab controls almost 70% of the country. And so this is a reminder that sanctions are also an act of war and aggression. And while we're told that they're meant to put pressure on hostile governments, we know that it's civilians who suffer most under that brutality. And the famine is also being exacerbated by US and NATO sanctions on Russia and the disruption that that has caused in the food supply chain. So not long after Joe Biden's election, he signed an order authorizing the deployment of hundreds of special operations forces to Somalia. The request was made by Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin, who prior to his government appointment was on the board of Raytheon, one of the world's largest military manufacturers and defense contractors. And so what these executive orders do is give the U.S. permission to engage in combat and engage in war without issuing a formal war declaration. And again, I think it's important to note that this is happening under a democratic presidency, that the African masses must surrender the illusion that there's a political party here in the belly of the beast that has a soft spot for Africans. Republicans and Democrats alike are enemies of the African people. In fact, it was during the Obama administration that AFRICOM really entrenched itself on the continent. And arguably, it was because Obama was black, there was so little coordinated pushback against it here in the United States. So Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, the recently elected president of Somalia, has expressed repeated gratitude for the U.S.'s commitment to a safe and stable Somalia and has said that their partnership is critical. This is a betrayal of the Somali people. In a recent press conference, he called on civilians to leave al shabaab controlled territories, warning ordinary people that they'll become collateral damage from U.S. airstrikes and night raids if they don't distance themselves from al shabaab fighters. This is an absurd statement to make when the militant group occupies at least 70% of the country. But what you see is the Comprador class already making excuses for a campaign that we know will lead to high civilian casualties. And AFRICOM reports on the civilian casualties of their drone strikes and aerial bombardments, but human rights groups routinely call them out for severely undercounting and misreporting those numbers. So the Somali people are twice persecuted. First, by terrorism, as they are the ones most impacted by al shabaabs violence. And then by counterterrorism initiatives that foreclose any real possibilities of peace. What is clear is that terrorism is a manufactured political crisis that provides U.S. imperialists and their allies with, with the necessary justification for their continued occupation and involvement on the continent. Terrorism is produced by conditions, lack of economic opportunity and advancement, corrupt governance, the erosion of dignity and the humiliation of neocolonialism and colonialism, the occupation of Somali territories, and there isn't a military solution to that problem. If there was, then the decades-long campaign would have had some success. All it's done is make the problem worse. So as Shabab didn't materialize out of thin air, in 2006, we had the formation of the Islamic Courts Union in Somalia, a grassroots nascent political party that was created to counter U.S.-funded warlords. The ICU seized control of Mogadishu and the federal government for the first time since the government's collapse in 1991. So it's important to note that this group had the support of the masses of people. Peace and order was restored and people began to see a return to normalcy and a kind of prosperity that they hadn't experienced in decades. And so how did the U.S. respond to this display of sovereignty and political independence? They initiated a proxy war. 
Ethiopia invaded Somalia. Some reports claim that as many as 30,000 troops were sent to the country. Fierce fighting ensued, hundreds of thousands of people died, the ICU was dissolved, and the more radical Islamists who made up the Islamic courts union formed a splinter group that came to be known as Al Shabaab. And so it's not hyperbolic to say that the U.S. made Al Shabaab what it is today, in the same way that the U.S. made the Taliban what it is in Afghanistan. But U.S. intervention in Somalia predates the war on terror. There was Operation Restore Hope in 1992, where the U.S., with the full support of the United Nations, invaded Somalia under the pretense of a humanitarian mission. Humanitarian mission is just a dog whistle for imperialist intervention and plunder. How are we to believe that the U.S. is moved by the suffering of the Somali people when they are responsible for most of that suffering? That was just the pretext that they used to invade the country. The mission ended in humiliation and defeat for foreign peacekeepers who were chased out of the country. So AFRICOM claims that a safe, stable, and prosperous Africa is an enduring American interest, but the presence of AFRICOM hasn't led to any safety or stability for the African people. It has led to prosperity for private defense contractors and weapons manufacturers. AFRICOM is just a front for the plunder and extraction of African resources. Geoseismic studies have shown that Somalia has at least 30 billion barrels of oil and gas reserves. The 80s, companies like Shell and Chevron had oil licenses, which would allow them to search for commercially feasible deposits for the extraction of petroleum. After the government collapsed in 1991, all of those licenses were suspended. In 2019, Shell and ExxonMobil paid Somalia's federal government $1.7 million dollars to renew their previous oil license for another 30 years. They currently own five oil blocks that would produce upwards of 10 million barrels of oil. And so companies are desperate to get their hands on these untapped oil reserves because they know that it'll net them billions of dollars. Somalia also holds significant geographic importance because of its coastline and the fact that it borders the Gulf of Aden. Nearly 20,000 ships pass through the Gulf of Aden annually. Millions of tons of crude oil, petroleum products, gas and dry commodities, 7% of the world's oil, 30% of Europe's oil passes through this toll. So it's, it's an extremely busy and financially lucrative trade route that the U.S. needs continued access to because the health of the capitalist economy is dependent on. So as you can imagine, Somali pirates were a nightmare for the global economy, causing billions of dollars in revenue losses. And this is why fighting piracy is one of the main focuses of counterterrorism offensives in the country. Of course, this discourse fails to mention that this piracy is a response to the plundering of marine resources and their and their destruction by pollution of the ocean. We don't talk about, we don't Sorry, talk, <laughs> thank you. We don't talk about the foreign pirates who pillaged and stole the resources of Somali fishermen who are dependent on those resources to feed and sustain their families, or the contamination of the Indian Ocean due to the illegal dumping of toxic waste that had disastrous consequences for the Solon people. So it's not about terrorism. It's not about humanitarian goodwill. It never has been, it never will be. It's about the continued plunder and extraction and theft of natural resources, resources that belong to the African people. Sociologists often call the phenomenon of resource-rich countries having less economic growth and power the resource port, the resource curse, or the paradox of plenty. But the only curse that the African people are experiencing is the curse of imperialism and militarized capitalism. The only way to defeat that curse is by building a militant and principled pan-African party that is capable of defeating imperialism and all reaction. Excellent. So I hope you found that informative. I, um, yeah. So we can move into um, a, a timeline of AFRICOM's development. Uh, and we can, we can see how it uh, developed beginning in 2007 uh, with the Bush administration announcing its development. Several African countries, including Libya, South Africa, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe, denouncing the concept many other African nations took a similar stand. Uh, President Bush visited Africa and encountered near unanimous rejection of this, Africa, uh, of this AFRICOM plan. Um, and in fact, uh, the US Army uh, published a piece 
in 2011 commenting on the media reaction uh, to AFRICOM on the continent was very tough. Uh, in Johannesburg, the Business Daily protested that the expansion of an American strategic geopolitical military base on the continent will only worsen many of the problems that Africa has at present. An outlet in Algiers said that the African countries should wake up after seeing the scars of others, referring here to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, a Nigerian journalist lamented at that time that increased US military presence in Africa may simply serve to protect unpopular regimes that are friendly to US interests, as was the case during the Cold War, while Africa slips further into poverty. Uh, despite this fierce opposition, AFRICOM was established and it's been headquartered in Germany outside of the African continent for this very reason. In 2009, uh, Muammar Gaddafi uh, was uh, elected president of the African Union and continued to voice his opposition to AFRICOM being based in Africa. And we know that in the following years, in 2011, uh, NATO forces led by the United States, France, and the United Kingdom began a bombing campaign with the intent to change the government in Libya. Uh, and after this massive bombing campaign, uh, Muammar Gaddafi and the remaining government forces uh, were um, uh, replaced and Gaddafi was brutally murdered in October. And following this conflict, this war in Libya, we see that captured Libyan arms are deployed to various armed groups, including Al Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. Now, the result of this is enhanced military capacities of Boko Haram in Nigeria, civil war in Mali, destabilization and armed conflict in the Central African Republic, Chad, Niger, and the dismembering of Libya. This is instructive as we witness mass infusions of weapons, of heavy weaponry into Eastern Europe at this time. And in zones all over the world, the United States floods with weapons uh, in order to um, create this sort of destabilization and the consequences and the outcomes are just come what may, okay? And um, we see that in uh, 2012, AFRICOM trained soldiers, uh, you know, led a coup in Mali. Uh, in 2015, an AFRICOM trained soldier led a coup in Burkina Faso. We see that in 2014, uh, it was estimated that between five and 8,000 U.S. troops were in Africa, that the U.S. had carried out 674 military missions across the continent. This is a 300% increase since AFRICOM was launched in 2008. And so as we see this pivot to Asia in the past decade, we're also witnessing a pivot to Africa, an increased uh, concentration on the African continent because of its importance. Uh, and we see that uh, there are various forms of US military presence on the continent, three categories uh, of basing being uh, foreign operating sites or forward operating sites, excuse me, cooperative security locations and contingency locations. You can also measure this through military to military cooperative agreements with various African states. And by 2016, there are 46 US bases, a network consisting of two forward operating sites, 13 cooperative security locations and 31 contingency locations on the African continent. And many of the military to military partnerships which the command has with 53 of Africa's 54 states include agreements to cede operational command to Africa. And uh, we can see this growth continue. In 2016, Camp Le Meunier in Djibouti uh, grew from uh, 88 acres in 2002 to 600 acres. In 2006, only 1% of all US commandos deployed overseas went to Africa. But 10 years later, 17%, more than 17% deployed overseas were in Africa. This is a pivot to Africa. Um, we can see that the United States is investing over $100 million in this camp in Niger. 
uh, where, uh, it, which is the area where four special forces uh, personnel were killed in 2017. Now, again, since the launch of AFRICOM in 2008, there's been a 1900% increase in US military presence on the African continent. The United States now conducts 3,500 exercises, programs, and engagements per year, an average of 10 missions per day on the African continent. And Africa has witnessed, at this point, the most dramatic growth in deployment of America's elite troops of any region of the globe over the past decade. And we can see here, uh, we can take a look at some of these programs in particular, okay, because I feel like they're they're very instructive. We should know the nitty gritty about what exactly is going on with these programs. For example, the International Military Training and Education Program brings African military officers to US military academies and schools. And countries participating in this program include Botswana, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, et cetera. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies could be seen as a school of the Americas for Africa. Uh, this provides indoctrination for next generation African military officers for the entire continent. Uh, the foreign military sales program, the United States military sells weapon, uh, sells equipment to African nations, uh, including Botswana, again, Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, Zimbabwe, uh, and even through a coastal and border security program, the United States provides patrol boats, vehicles, uh, electronic surveillance equipment, night vision equipment to coastal states. These are just some of the programs. These are just some of the examples. And we see the combined joint task force in the Horn of Africa is based at Camp Lemonnier in Djibouti and is aimed at putting down rebellions in the Horn of Africa in countries such as Ethiopia and Somalia. And we see that the Tripartite Plus Intelligence Fusion Cell, which is based in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, oversees regional security. What does that mean? Ensuring US and Israeli access to Congo's gold, diamonds, uranium, platinum, and coltan. This is a colonizing force bleeding the continent of its resources, uh, depriving Africans of their security, of their sovereignty. This is a colonizing force. It's absolutely what it is. Uh, and you can see several sources of information here, um, or you can find a lot of this information, uh, a reading list with more information. I do encourage you, following this, once this is published online, pause on these slides. Look at some of these sources. Read this information. Understand what the United States is doing in Africa. And now we can move into... Um, a little bit of the uh, modern geopolitical context, particularly as it pertains to uh, this Cold War, this ongoing war between the United States and China and Russia. And we see that at its annual summit in June, NATO named Africa, uh, along with the Middle East, as NATO's southern neighborhood. The following month, outgoing commander of AFRICOM General Stephen J. Townsend referred to Africa as NATO's southern flank. This is reminiscent of the neo-colonial attitude that we've seen in the Monroe Doctrine of the 19th century, which continues to this day with the United States claiming that Latin America is its backyard. This, again, is the position of a global power which sees the entire planet as its zone of control, not just the North Atlantic, but the entire planet. And that is why Africa and the Middle East are its neighborhood. That is why Latin America is its neighborhood. The entire world is its zone of control. This is the logic of a colonizing force committed to depriving the peoples and nations of the world, of the African continent, of their sovereignty and self-determination in the name of preserving unipolarity um, and the hegemonic force of the US empire. And just as one example, we see that in April of this year, the US House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed a piece of legislation called the Countering Malign Russian Activities in Africa Act, which we should look at in detail because this act targets 
influence and activities which manipulate African governments and their policies, as well as the public opinions and voting preferences of African populations and diaspora groups, including those in the United States. We should be thinking of how this will be utilized moving forward to continue to repress the legitimate aspirations to liberation of Africans on the continent as well as in the United States. Targeting activities which manipulate African governments as well as the public opinions and voting preferences of African populations and diaspora groups. And who will be the judge of which influence and activities are manipulating governments and peoples? It's gonna be the United States. This sort of legislation passed with overwhelming support from the US Congress is very dangerous. And no doubt it's gonna continue and it's going to escalate as African nations forge greater ties with Russia, with China, for that matter, nations that pursue any sort of self-determined path, which may exclude the United States from consideration. So now we can move into, um, you know, one more short video uh, featuring some members of the Black Alliance for Peace uh, discussing why this is important for Black people in the United States. Why should Black people care about what is happening in Africa as it pertains to them in the United States? So let's take a look here. Why should Black people, why should anyone in the United States care about all of this information you've just given us about uh, the expansion of the United States military state? Uh, but why should Black people care in particular, especially Black people in the United States? Why should Black people in Baltimore be concerned about what the United States military is doing in Africa? Right. Um, very, very in important. Uh, question. Um, so while while the the United States military was ramping up mili uh, militarization in Africa, um, simultaneously the Obama administration was ramping up militarization right here of of colonized you know black and poor working class neighborhoods in the United States. Um, and this this involves even using some of the very same weapons and the very same uh, tactics and, and techniques uh, to kind of squash any kind of uprisings that that occur. Um, uh, one one thing I like to look at is is life expectancy. Like, let's take the Upton uh, Druid Hills neighborhood in, in Baltimore. So and, and compare that to life expectancy um in the wealthy white roland park area and, and roland park um if you're lucky enough to be living there your life expectancy is 84 um whereas in upton um it is 68 and that is on par uh with nations that it, that the united states uh, uh occupies and and bombs uh it, it's more on par with that than it is the rest of the united states so we don't have a situation in uh, Druid Hill where the United States is dropping bombs on, on the neighborhood, right? There's no one drone bombing Druid Hill. So how is American militarism abroad affecting the life expectancy of people in poor and especially poor black neighborhoods? How, how where's the, where's the connection? Right. Well, um, there, there is, you know, militarization is not only about about dropping bombs. It, it is it is also the threat of, of having militarized police and surveillance in a community. You know, there, there are two programs domestically um, in, in particular that are responsible for this, you know, occupied. I was going to say occupied feeling, but uh, it, it's a reality, occupied reality um, in, in our neighborhoods. Um, the, there's the 1033 program, uh, which allows any kind of local police uh, to obtain military weapons from the Pentagon at reduced rates or for free. And this this even applies to uh, school districts and campus police can get these weapons. Um, and then we also have what has been named uh, the deadly deadly exchange program which is a police exchange 
between U.S. police and Israeli police, where they trade uh, tactics um, and, and techniques. Now, Israeli police you know, is, is known to be one of the most violent occupying uh, police forces that there is. Um, and so, and, and Israeli police, meanwhile, recognize um, that United, United States police um, are, are a, a terrorizing force on, on Black people domestically. So this this intent so there's this intensification of militarization that we particularly see, um, you know, when when black people are uprising here over shootings or over conditions in in their neighborhoods. Then it is very much out in the in the open. But this but this affects affects us just the, the daily stress of living under these conditions um, affects our health even. So under the 1033 program in particular, I'm, I'm recalling images from Ferguson, Missouri. I'm recalling images from right here in Baltimore uh, during the Freddie Gray uprising, where you see police officers in what look like militarized vehicles, like tanks. So you're saying that they really do come from the Department of Defense. And not only can police departments, but you also said, Vanessa, campus police oh, and, yes. and school police, yes. as in public school police, can obtain the same type of materials. Yes, yes, yes. Um, arm, armored vehicles, uh, gren grenades, um, rifles, automatic, automatic weapons, um, and any of, any of these kinds of military weapons are obtained. So, Nessa, what does Black Alliance for Peace do in order to combat these kinds of programs uh, and also to educate and mobilize people to understand why they have to be aware of them and why they have to be opposed? What campaigns does Black Alliance for Peace have uh, that people can be joined with? So um, three major campaigns. So the first one was uh, the coalition was it is participating in the coalition to, to close U.S. military bases around the world. Um, and then we we've done that with a sense of coalition, a lot of direct action and things like that. The two main campaigns that are pretty much I don't even know that's it's, it's actually kind of one campaign. The two two things we see them as one, but two uh, components to it. Is first the U.S. out of Africa shutdown, Africa, um, where in both of these were you know, using petition drives, uh, direct um, teach-ins, things like that, going on, doing media, doing propaganda work in terms of, well, people. I, I use the term propaganda work. I know people might not be used to it that way, sure. but it's really just passing around information right? sure. for a particular purpose. Yes, but it becomes as a you know word, charged word. But we do we pass out information about it. We do media about it. We do um, uh, going on to like we did, went on the hills. So we're trying to get other policymakers to understand and maybe set some resolutions or or uh, legislation or whatever around these kind of things. Uh, briefings like the one we're going to try to do a briefing um, on the hill. Get the policymakers to do a briefing on the hill about the impact of Africa, because we want all the U.S. all the withdrawal of all U.S. military presence on the continent, and then uh, for uh, the for there to be this briefing that talks about the impact of it. Um, and then that I mentioned the other side of the domestic side is no compromise, no retreat. Yes. Uh, tell me the rest of the, it, it, it's the looking at. Defeat, defeat the war against uh, African black people in the United States. And so those are the two things. And then uh, one part of this campaign has to be, and we actually have both organization members and uh, individual members. So we want organizations uh, black organizations uh, that want to take up this call to join Black Alliance for Peace and so we can coordinate our activities around these things. Um, one is to get the policymakers to have an unequivocal position on what AFRICOM militarism in our you know communities, the 1033 program, AFRICOM, uh, to not be able, because right now they're not even talking about it. You would think this is not, it doesn't even exist. We had, in fact, just recently there was a bill a few years ago, a bill by Grayson, 
uh, to repeal 1033 program. And a lot of the, a lot of the uh, black, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus members or the black uh, representatives voted against that bill. And so, and right now they don't even talk about Africa. They act like they don't even know it exists. And so we want to change. What? Okay. So, you know, as discussed in that video, you know, the 1033 program is an important component which ties the domestic to the international, okay, that we should all be aware of, because this is how this military weaponry enters communities all over this country. As was referenced in that video, I'm sure many of us recall from Ferguson observing this small town as a hyper-militarized force once uh, political action was taken by community members. And this is what's in store and what will continue to be in store uh, for uh, people across this country learning what's at stake and acting on it and agitating against this system. And this is the power that law enforcement agencies hold, the ability to procure these weapons from the United States military and to use them on people within the United States. Uh, and post 9-11, these transfers ramped up, you know, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, law enforcement agencies amassed a collection of more than a billion and a half dollars worth of military equipment. Um, the Pentagon's weapons and tactics developed for overseas occupations, coups and wars uh, on Africans and other colonized people around the world uh, are being deployed to control and terrorize black people in the United States. Uh, and it's important to remember that police militarization uh, was first established uh, following the Black Liberation Movement in the 1960s and 70s. It was established to put an end to that political activity. And so as we're nearing the end here, we can uh, read an excerpt from this interview with Erica Keynes, who is on the coordinating committee of the Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, and in this interview, which is part of uh, the AFRICOM Watch Bulletin, which is a monthly newsletter published by the Black Alliance for Peace uh, to provide updates and context surrounding AFRICOM. Uh, in this particular interview, they spoke about the 1033 program and the connection between the militarization of police forces in the US and what the US is doing abroad. Again, uh, Erica mentioned that to understand the militarization of black communities, which includes the use of SWAT units, whose origins are anchored in the takedown of Black liberation struggles in the U.S., it must be understood that Black people in the U.S. have a colonial relationship with the larger society, a relationship characterized by over-policing and institutional racism. Police are used to enforce the status quo of white ruling class power and colonial control over the lives of Black, Brown, and other oppressed nations of people. This is a mirror image of the imperial relationship between the United States and the African continent. And these similarities are most evident when we examine the use of the 1033 program and the US military programs like AFRICOM, seemingly used in so-called wars against terrorism and drugs. And that imperialism should not only be understood as a global matter manifested through US military occupation, but also a domestic issue manifested through the occupation of our communities by militarized police forces. Um, and just as the demand for the US out of Africa and self-determination is the key to the struggles on the continent, uh, ending federal police programs like the 1033 program is the key to fighting back here in the United States. And this can't be done without organized struggle. This is key. This cannot be done without organized struggle. So, you know, as we, as we conclude here, you know, it's important for us to uh, take a few moments to think about what strategies and tactics uh, we can use uh, to confront AFRICOM here. Who are some of our allies? Who are some of our opponents?
it's important for us to think about how we can agitate, how we can educate other people in our communities, and importantly, how we can organize action, you know, how we can leverage our power, our labor power, how we can leverage our position within the United States, how we can use our platforms to speak on this issue and to connect with people across the world, across the country. We're in a time where we can be connecting with people all over the world and coordinating our actions so that we can amplify our strength as a collective mass to confront these issues. And our proximity here in the United States to this colonial power in the United States, which is the United States, uh, provides us a special duty to make sure that we are organized and we are thinking clearly about what's in front of us and what is demanded of us and that we are making an effort to uh, decisively challenge and ultimately defeat the United States and AFRICOM in order to liberate the world from the shackles of this colonial capitalist system. And so um, we'll go ahead and um, you know, refer to uh, you know several resources here. As I said, um, you know, I encourage you to join an organization. It's important that we don't exist on an island as individuals in this country. That we are pursuing the options in front of us. We are surveying the landscape and joining organizations so that we can be building capacity to confront these things, or building new organizations. If you don't feel like the organizations out there are sufficient. If you have better ideas, okay, um, please consider joining the Black Alliance for Peace. Consider joining DSA's International Committee. Join organizations which are fighting imperialism and learn more about these issues. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here real quick. Um, so, yeah, we can open this up to some questions. Um, remarks, reflections. We can kind of think about that last slide where we think about um, what kinds of strategies and tactics we can exercise, uh, who are our allies, who are our opponents in this realm. And um, yeah, so so if, let's see, let's see in the Q&A function here, let's see what we have. Uh, and, and you can also use uh, the chat. Uh, so please, if you have any other, uh, you know, questions or reflections, please feel free to um, to speak up at the moment. And somebody wanted to point out here, Abel wanted to point out, just wanted to mention that AOC, Bush, uh, Talib, and the rest of the squad all voted for the legislation that I mentioned before, the Countering Malign Russian Activities in Africa Act. It's important for us to recognize who are our allies. Again, as we were just mentioning, uh, in the congressional realm, um, we have to be clear-headed about the interests that are represented in that space and uh, be clear-headed that um, these congressional representatives are not going to be the vehicle toward closing um, and uh, and dismantling AFRICOM. That's the unfortunate reality. So what else should we be doing and can we be doing uh, in thinking creatively about how we as people can be confronting this? Is there anything that we can do to hold DSA electeds accountable for such votes? Hmm. Um, I'm the electoral uh, arena is not my forte, so I'm not really sure how to hold our elected officials accountable, to be completely honest. We can vote them in, we can vote them out, we can send them letters, we can show up at their office, we can call them. I don't know what works. I don't know what doesn't work. Um, I'm sure that good faith efforts have been made to confront these congressional representatives on a whole host. Of, you know, there are so many pieces of legislation that um, you know, seemingly well-intentioned politicians lend their support to, and their constituents, I'm sure, voice their opposition. Does that change? I don't see it changing. I don't see this circumstance changing uh, in that arena. So um, I'm not sure. But if other people understand the electoral arena and they want to leverage that in, in an intelligent way, 
please please think of how how best to do that. Uh, and Patterson says that we could start locally. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we want to be thinking about these things uh, at the granular level, locally, at the state level, nationally, and internationally. We have to be thinking big picture and um, and doing what we can uh, in our communities. We can be teaching our community members uh, uh, about these issues. And again, not just leaving it at raising awareness but encouraging action and thinking about how we can be acting on this information and what our duties are, what we are compelled to do, uh, considering our proximity to uh, the United States. We are in the belly of the beast, which, which provides us with special responsibilities if we are committed to acting in solidarity with uh, the peoples of the world uh, on this matter. Okay, so let me see here. Can you talk more about how the war in Ukraine has changed the situation in Africa US relations? Sure, I mean, you know, just briefly, uh, uh, you know, we can see that uh, where African nations have fallen with regard to whether they are um, uh, supportive of the United States' position in this war, the way that the United States has uh, attempted to uh, discipline Russia uh, for its actions, uh, imposing sanctions, um, and where African states fall in that uh, equation will certainly influence how the United States responds to those nations. You know, it's essentially a situation of um, fall in line you know, fall in line and uh, and help us uh, combat Russian imperialism. Well, guess what? Not all African states are going to be backing that position. You know, whether it's pragmatically or it's ideologically, there are many African states who uh, hold um, important relationships with Russia, um, economic relationships, diplomatic relationships. It's very, uh, it's complicated. and And the continent has not simply... Uh, backed this effort uh, by the United States. Um, and so, you know, this is going to have material impacts uh, through sanctions regimes that are imposed upon Russia. And um, this is going to affect African states' uh, access to uh, different kinds of materials, you know, food crops, um, all kinds of things. You know, African states may find themselves uh, the, um, on the, um, through what are called secondary sanctions where, you know, non-target countries are also going to be affected because they're going to be prohibited from trading with the target country. Um, and so what this essentially does is it impedes and, um, curtails the sovereignty of all nations all over the world. This is how sanctions operate. And this is how the United States is, um, developing this you know, and seeing who is falling in line behind its uh, position vis-a-vis -vis Russia and vis-a-vis -vis China as well. It it's, doesn't stand to reason that the United States is going to be friendly um, with countries who are not uh, completely supportive of their efforts to preserve unipolarity in the world. And uh, Nick in the comments says that it's important to begin linking the violence of the police and the criminal legal system here in the United States to the international violence of AFRICOM and operations like it, drawing connections to police occupations of our neighborhoods, to military occupations on the continent under pretext of violence and terrorism. Absolutely. We should also examine Israel's role in neocolonialism and training African militaries in this neocolonial landscape. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, and yeah, so... Um, are there uh, any other questions or reflections on, on what we've been discussing here? I don't think I see anything else here in the Q&A uh, section. So um,
Drew is wondering, um, you know, do you believe multipolarity represents an opportunity for African nations to assert their independence or will it only lead to a more chaotic imperial situation? Multipolarity is an opportunity for countries to pursue self-determination. And, and conversely, unipolarity, it's important to recognize, um, uh, essentially forecloses on other countries being able to exercise any kinds of alternatives. Uh, when the trade deals that you're making are governed by the United States and the United States only, and these trade deals are going to be advantageous to the United States, and there is no other competing uh, offer uh, on hand, then yes, this is going to be a preservation of U.S. hegemony. It only stands to reason that um, as other countries in the world rise and uh, extend themselves um, economically, diplomatically, politically to other countries all over the world, uh, self-determination is going to be uh, possible at that point. And it isn't possible as long as U.S. hegemony continues to swallow the entire planet. Okay, um, well, it looks like that's, um, that's what we have here for tonight. I hope that this was informative. And again, I hope that you will feel compelled to act on this and to join an organization and become uh, you know, politically active in this realm. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. I hope you have a great evening and uh, thanks.